I'm Hamish Johnston, editor of physicsworld.com, and I'm here in Dallas, Texas, for the March meeting of the American Physical Society. With me is MIT's Frank Wilczek, who shared the 2004 Nobel Prize in Physics for his work on asymptotic freedom in the theory of the strong interaction. Frank is here in Dallas to talk about connections between superconductivity theory and particle physics. Frank, in your talk today, you mentioned some classic applications of superconductivity theory yeah. to particle physics. Can you give a few examples? Well, the two classic examples that have really been <clears throat> rich in consequences are uh, the concept that the whole cosmos is a superconductor that, uh, for the weak interactions, that as in an ordinary superconductor, the photon becomes massive. In the cosmic superconductor, the photon does not become massive, but uh, W and Z bosons become massive, and that enables a kind of unified treatment of different interactions. And uh, the other one, going back further, is the idea that uh, quarks and antiquarks pair up to form a condensate that fills all space, just like uh, Cooper pairs in a superconductor fill all space, and oscillations in that condensate and that medium of uh, quarks and antiquarks uh, are what we know as pions. They're particles whose uh, properties can be successfully predicted on the basis of this picture. So both of those tell us that the space that we perceive as empty is actually full of these materials that. Uh, change the behavior of particles moving through them in much the same way as properties of photons are changed when they're uh, inside a superconductor. The, the, the theory of topological insulators is also sort of a ripe area for new ideas. Yes. Are, are you seeing any, any crossovers between that field and particle physics? Well, the, yes. <laughs> in fact, the uh, the uh, the equation, the central equations for topological insulators are something that I wrote down a um, long time ago, I think like 25 years ago, uh, just on the basis of mathematical elegance and what was uh, natural from the point of view of symmetry and how you might modify electrodynamics. Uh, so, so yes, I mean, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a marvelous embodiment of uh, con concepts that, that are logical uh, extensions or logical uh, modifications, whatever you want to call it, of the uh, kinds of ideas we've been developing in quantum field theory. Another example of that, not unrelated to topological insulators, is um, this whole concept of enions, particles that have unusual quantum statistics that have become uh, interesting now and a focus of attention due to their possible use in quantum computers. Um, these also I introduced by just sort of exploring the theoretical possibilities, what's natural to have within a theory that has a lot of symmetry and uh, topology and gauge interactions. So mixing these, it's a rich mix that the theory of superconductivity has given us. These big ideas of pairing, of uh, symmetry breaking with gauge symmetry, and with topology, all those ideas really have their deep roots in work on superconductivity, and they've become dominant tools for fundamental physics. F physicists have been working on a, a theory of high TC superconductivity for 25 years yeah. now, and um, it's, it's been very difficult. It's been very, a very tough nut to crack. Right. Do, do, do you have any feelings as to why that is, and are there any parallels in other fields of physics, other difficult, similar? Problems. Right. Well, we really won't know how difficult it is until it's been solved, and we'll be able to say in retrospect how difficult it should have been. Uh, the, uh, but I, well, it's not, I, in a broad sense, there it's not unique. There have been frustrating periods before when people uh, had you know, fairly well-defined problems in mind, but just didn't know how to uh, solve them. The theory of superconductivity itself was that way. Right. The whole phenomenon of superconductivity was really extremely mysterious 
for upwards of 40 years. And um, it's only with BCS theory that it really became something integrated into theoretical physics. But that was 45 years after the discovery. Um, other examples are, well, the things that haven't been solved, like the whole problem of turbulence in hydrodynamics is a physics problem that hasn't been solved despite a lot of effort for many years. There are also successful cases like the theory of um, phase transition, second order phase transition was mysterious for quite a while but then got sorted out convincingly and, um, that that's been very fruitful as well. It's hard to know what what's going on in high temperature superconductivity. People have ideas that seem entirely disconnected from each other. We heard today uh, Professor Muller talk about uh, bipolarons, but uh, as he said, most theorists who worked on the problem think that you don't have to worry about polarons at all, and you should just and you should have purely electronic theory. So, so there's no agreement even about exactly what the problem is you're supposed to solve, mm -hmm. <laughs> let alone what the solution is. Uh, unlike most physicists, you've worked across a fairly broad range of topics in your career. Do you, do you think that there's enough of, of that sort of cross-fertilization between fields of physics, or do you think maybe sometimes that gets in the way? Well, in some, some barriers have definitely fallen. I think the barrier between uh, condensed matter physics and quantum field theory has completely fallen away. I mean, young people now move freely across that border and it's, you know, it's porous. <laughs> Similarly, the, the uh, but whereas it wasn't always that way. When I was a graduate student, it wasn't that way at all. I mean, particles were particles and <sighs> solids were solids and eminent physicists talked about, in my, in, in high energy physics talked about squalid state physics and, you know, <laughs> there's a kind of snobbery about not working on it. There was also a big separation between cosmology, which was regarded as very speculative and poor in data as against uh, fun particle physics. Uh, but that's also fallen away. Now people move freely and a lot of the most uh, exciting and important work in both areas is, is heavily informed by the other. Uh, I think, however, that there are other barriers that haven't fallen. <laughs> that are still very much there. I think there's a barrier in general between uh, people who do numerical work and people who do so-called analytic work because there's a big th investment that you have to do if you want to actually use high-powered computers in a serious way. Uh, there's a barrier, I think, between uh, that could benefit from falling <laughs> between uh, chemistry and, uh, and certain parts of physics. Chemists have really interesting examples and a lot of elegant, a lot of lovely phenomena. So I think, for instance, at this conference, chemistry is underrepresented. It's hard to say that anything is underrepresented at such a giant conference, but, but uh, yeah, I think, I think chemists and certain kinds of chemists and physicists have things to talk about, and, and probably most of all biologists. Biology is, of course, a gigantic field now, but it, it contains parts that... Uh, I think would benefit from uh, more physical insight and, and vice versa. They, it poses some very interesting uh, physics questions. Okay, well thanks. Uh, thanks for speaking to us. Uh,